Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Revelation. And we're looking tonight at the church in Sardis, part one, though I do have a few more things to say about the church at Thyatira, which we were looking at last week. We're over in Revelation chapter three, but I'm going to read the part about Thyatira, which is at the end of Revelation two, as well as Revelation chapter three, because there are some important connections uh, between the two churches. In fact, I hope you see what I've been doing as we've been going through the study of showing similarities between the churches and the differences and which churches Christ commends and which churches Christ does not commend and which churches have a mixture of both commendation and also of approbation. So I'll begin reading in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. And unto the church, the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Both are pictures of judgment. I know thy works, and charity. And that, of course, is what Ephesus didn't have. And service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh 
The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will cause us tonight to hear what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God says to this church. Help us to hear with understanding and believing ears. Help us to repent and to obey. Father, we commit this once again, this word of yours to the hearts of each here, those who are listening in over the internet, that you might make us the church you would have us to be. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you are listening to the reading of chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, I hope you picked up a few of the things that I was trying to emphasize with my voice as we read through that. Remember, this is addressed unto the angel or the messenger. We would call him the pastor of the church in Thyatira. He was allowing a female teacher by the name given to her here in Revelation of Jezebel to teach certain things in the church. And he was not contradicting her, and he was not stopping her, and she had gathered quite a following and was involved in immorality herself and leading others into immorality. She was teaching false doctrine that said it was okay. She was teaching a perverted form of Christian liberty, which we have discussed in the past. And you remember back at the very beginning, it talked about the wonderful works of this church. Verse 19, I know thy works. At the end of the verse, and thy works, and the last will be more than the first. And then at the end, it talks about their works. But then it talks about something else in verse 26. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Our works may be diligent, our works may be wonderful, our works may seem faithful, our works may continue to increase as they did here at the church at Thyatira, but Jesus wants us to keep his works unto the end. It's interesting that the pastor of that church did not have the same doctrine as Jezebel, but unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. The one burden was, get rid of Jezebel. Counter her doctrine. Counter her practice. Call those who have fallen into it to repentance. I'll spare their lives if they repent, but if they don't repent, I'm going to kill them. And I think her children here refers not merely to her own physical children, but all of those who were her spiritual children who had gained some ascendancy and power in that church. And then the last part of the section dealing with Thyatira, it's a fascinating section because it moves into the prophecy of Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is one of the great messianic psalms. It talks about the Messiah coming and crushing and treading underfoot all of the nations which have been in rebellion against him and breaking them with a rod of iron, smashing them like, like a pot as you would hit it with a rod of iron. And he says, if you will do this, what I've just told you to do, get rid of Jezebel, Call those who followed her to repentance. If they don't, I'll kill them. That's rather serious. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about that, where he said to the church at Corinth, you know, some of you have gotten sick and some of you have died 
fallen asleep is a euphemism for dying because you're coming to the Lord's table with unclean hands and hearts. And God won't put up with that. That was going on at Thyatira. It had gone on at Corinth. Apparently they did repent because we then have 2 Corinthians, which deals with other problems, but also deals with more commendation as well. But Thyatira apparently never repented. Jezebel was never removed. But what an incredible promise. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. If you keep hanging on unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Jesus is talking about when he comes back to rule over the earth in the millennium. Here's a church that had a prophetic future if they would merely obey what Jesus said. And they would be involved in his judgment over the earth. Not just, I will rule them with a rod of iron, but that's the promise, of course, there in Psalm chapter 2. But he, that is the one who overcomes, he's going to do it with me. What incredible promises we give up when we insist on our own carnal ways, when we insist on refusing to take a stand for Christ, when we compromise and allow others who teach false doctrine and immoral practice to have ascendancy in the church and do not discipline them and do not cast them out. They gave this up. They didn't get to rule with a rod of iron. It's still yet future, but there was a promise. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Now remember, this is Jesus speaking here. Jesus is saying, I am the one of whom Psalm 2 speaks. I am the messianic king who will crush the heads over the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. Psalm 2 is clearly messianic, and Jesus claims it here in Revelation chapter 2. And I will give him the morning star. That's another fascinating phrase there at the end of Revelation 2. Because, of course, the morning star, the bright and morning star, the star of David, is Jesus himself. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And that brings us to chapter 3, under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now you recall as we studied Revelation chapter 1 that the number 7 is the number of completeness or perfection. And we looked at many, many, many passages in Scripture that deal with that issue, and we saw all of these incredible number of sevens in the book of Revelation. So here is the complete... Spirit of God. Jesus is not lacking in any of that. This is the one who has the complete Spirit of God and the seven stars. Remember, the seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches. And here he talks about works again. Remember, that was the first thing he talked to the church at Thyatira. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. He knows their works too. It's the first thing he mentions. I know thy works. I see what is on the outside. It was a church that looked like it was doing great things for Jesus. But notice then what he says. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Imagine someone standing here in the pulpit, but it's not really a living body. It's being controlled 
by pneumatic mechanisms or mechanical mechanisms, sort of like the animatronics that you see at Epcot Center or Disney World or even there at the Creation Museum uh, in Kentucky. And this thing is moving its hands and it is talking and the eyeballs are moving back and forth but it's dead. That's what Jesus says about the church at Sardis. You have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. Now let's try to tie that in with the churches that we've looked at already. You remember Ephesus and Pergamos had problems with Nicolaitans, and of course nobody goes by the name Nicolaitan today. But many churches today, as we discussed, are Nicolaitan in nature. And between those was the martyr church, the church at Smyrna. Smyrna lives, Ephesus and Pergamos died. Now we're talking about a church that looked like it was alive, but it was already dead. They still had a faithful remnant, but the church was dead. And today Ephesus and Pergamos are dead. We noted something else about Nicolaitanism because we see that in these three churches that we've studied so far, not counting Smyrna, and we're now on church number five and we're going to see the same thing in that. The Nicolaitan heresy could be divided into two halves. Number one, evil doctrine. That's what we see at Thyatira. Jezebel was teaching evil doctrine and immoral practices. That's what we saw at Thyatira. Now we're moving here to the church at Sardis. And he talks about some who have not defiled their garments, just a few of them, but that implies that the rest of them had defiled their garments. Now, Sardis was known for a special process for dyeing wool. And the word that he uses to translate defiled their garments, think about clothing, Sardis, a great commercial clothing center, dyeing process, and he says, that's the word for staining a garment. Staining it so it's almost impossible to get the stain out of the garment. We have somebody here whose relatives are involved in the dry cleaning business and taking stains out of garments, and some of them are more difficult than others. And so he's using an illustration that will make sense to the people at Sardis. You have a few names which have not defiled their garments, which means that most of them had defiled their garments. As you look at that term garments through scripture, you discover that it's also a very fascinating word because Paul talks about being clothed upon with the garment of our body, and then we die and we shed that garment, but we're going to get an intermediate body before we are clothed upon again with our resurrection body. There were many who had defiled their garment, not just their exterior clothes, but they had defiled themselves. We see some very clear parallels here. There's some bad doctrine that's led to sloth in the church, and there is immorality which has stained them. We saw that the church at Ephesus no longer existed because they'd lost their first love for Christ. But Thyatira had a love for Christ, and yet they died because they also had Jezebel, and that ended up being the sinker for Thyatira. Smyrna did not have Jezebel, but they did have a love for Christ, and they still live today, even though they didn't have as much doctrine as Ephesus had. And that was our perfect introduction to the church number four, Thyatira, because we paralleled the spiritual cult of the Virgin Mary, which began in 431 in Ephesus, with Thyatira, which had a physical cult leader, a female named Jezebel. God never ordained, I said this last week, never ordained spiritual female leadership in the church like the worship of Mary at Ephesus, and God never ordained physical female leadership in the church, which brought us to the sex cult at Thyatira. We talked about Christian liberty. 
We know what? We're running into that again here as we move into the church at Sardis. Their liberty was not to go to the excesses. Their liberty was to sit back and do nothing. You know, they might even be predestinarian and sovereignty of God people. Sort of like those who opposed the missionary moment, our movement in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And William Carey, as he was heading off to the mission field, someone said to him, we don't need to go and reach the lost. If they're elect, God will save them anyway. The theology of sloth. Hey, God's in control. What are you worried about you doing anything? Don't you realize what a nothing you are? Who cares what we do? God's going to get his work done. God is sovereign. God will save them if he wants to. That's the kind of attitude we find at Sardis. The Christian liberty to do nothing. Not the Christian liberty to do all kinds of evil things, but the so-called Christian liberty to sit and do nothing. And there are some people in this church who essentially sit and do nothing. I think we'll see some other parallels here to Sardis in just a few moments with our church as well. We talked about making the church, quote, relevant to the culture, but you don't make it relevant. What you do with the relevancy is you call them to repentance, and that's what's truly relevant. So we looked at the four words of praise at Pergamos, the words that prove salvation, the clinging to the name of Christ through thick and thin, never denying the faith of Christ in martyrdom. Thyatira, even worse, church, had more words of praise. There were ten, in fact, but they had Jezebel, and they did nothing about it. Now we get to Sardis, and the church as a whole has no words of praise. There are few there who have some words of praise, but the church as a whole have no words of praise about them. Thyatira was an active church. Sardis was a dead church. Sardis was a sit-and-do-nothing church. The primary sin at Pergamos appears to be worldliness. The primary sin of Thyatira appears to be cultural accommodation and compromise. The primary sin at Sardis is do-nothingness. It's sloth. It's ho-hum Christianity. It's we've got a good name already. Why do we need to do anything? Everybody already thinks well about our church. Everybody has heard about our church. This past week, I was talking to an elderly gentleman I met out front of one of the drugstores in the area, not too far from here, not the one across the street, but a ways away. And uh, in his 80s, he was 83 years old, and in the course of the conversation, I was sharing Christ with him. He says, well, what church do you go to? Well, I said, you know, that one down on the corner of Haddon and Cuthbert. He says, oh, McIntyre's church. And you know something? Even though he was Roman Catholic, though not practicing, he hadn't been to church in years, he said, wow, that church, I really have heard about that church, and uh, man, yeah, I think he said he'd heard McIntyre once. He said, he was really a good speaker. And, and that church was really active. And I, and I heard him when he was preaching. He preached against homosexuality. And that was 30, 40 years ago. I mean, Dr. McIntyre was ahead of his time. He'd heard about the church. It had a name. It, he heard that it was a living church. He heard that it was an active church. He heard that it was an involved church. He heard that it was a church that confronted the issues with the Bible. It's a church that has a name that it lives. You fill in the rest of the sentence. We saw a contrast 
There in Revelation chapter 2, they gave the transition from Pergamos to Thyatira, which was the fornication plot of Balaam and the thing sacrificed to idols. Both of those are mentioned also at Thyatira. She, this Jezebel, was teaching people to have things that were sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication, just like the church at Pergamos, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So there was a tie-in between those two. Now we move to the next church, and we see there they don't care one way or the other about any of it. We talked about antinomians who accuse Christians uh, who are thoughtful Christians of being legalists because thoughtful Christians will try to hold the line on moral purity and separation. And most of the so-called evangelical church today is antinomian. They don't want any absolute standards. They want flexible standards. If you hold absolute standards, they'll call you a legalist. And we talked about the four different types of legalism. We're not going to go into that again tonight. I hope you remember what they are. And then we talked about the four categories of carnal arguments used by carnal Christians who want to excuse their sins. We won't go over those again. Then we studied the injunctions in Romans 2, 3, and 6 to demonstrate the true Christian position on how to handle sin in our lives and not to be legalists. And we noted that Paul mentions both those problems, adultery and idols, in Romans chapter 2, verse 22, and we suggested to you last week, and I want to develop that a little bit more this week, that Jezebel had probably heard Paul's teaching and John's teaching on that subject of adultery and things offered unto idols, but she had twisted it. And she had twisted it in the context of Christian liberty, and we saw that over in uh, 1 Corinthians and chapter 8. We talked about the weaker brother. We talked about chapter 9, how Paul talked about his right to marry and his right to get paid, and how the church should, church should pay the pastor, and how to witness to Jews and Gentiles or in heavenly rewards. And that brought us to chapter 10, which is where we are tonight. Here we have chapter 10, sacrifices offered to idols in the context of the Lord's table. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The cup of bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Now remember the bread is the body of Christ. We're all partakers of the bread. Behold Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. So remember we're talking about things offered to idols, stuff that was put on an altar in front of an idol. And so Paul says now, I've just reminded you of your position and how you're partaking of the sacrifice of Christ and you memorialize that when you take the Lord's table. And then he says, okay, let's apply that to idolatry. Verse 19. What say I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifices to idols anything? There's, yeah, it's nothing. Now, that's the verses that probably Jezebel picked up on in Thyatira. What say I then? Is the idol anything or that which is offered in sacrifices to idols? Is that anything? But then she skipped verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. That's daimonion, that's demons. And not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You see, Jezebel was saying, it's okay, because it doesn't matter if you cause weaker brothers to stumble, and it doesn't matter if you're really having fellowship with those people who are there in the process of worshiping demonic forces. What Paul is teaching here is that behind every idol, there is a demon seeking to be worshipped. You know, I've traveled extensively in different parts of the world. Traveled in Mexico, and traveled in South America. I've traveled over in China. I've traveled in Europe and seen many of the cathedrals where they have these big statues and gargoyles. 
I've seen some of those churches, well, they're called churches here in the United States, and I've seen their statues. Behind every idol, there is a demon seeking to be worshipped. And when people genuflect in front of those idols, when they say prayers in front of those idols, when they light candles in front of those idols, when they bring gifts of flowers and lay them at the feet of the idol, when they bring different types of sacrifices to the idol, when they light incense sticks in front of those idols, they are worshiping demons according to what Paul says here. And Jezebel said, ah, it doesn't make any difference. Because after all, who cares about the idols? And there's nothing wrong with the food. It doesn't have, you know, idol cooties on it. Paul says, let's go a little deeper than what you see on the surface. Behind every idol, there is a demon seeking to be worshipped. Did you know that in Hinduism, they have 300 million so-called gods? 300 million. And so there are little shrines and little images all over the place. It always burns me when I walk into a Christian home and they have as decoration a fat little Buddha sitting over in some corner with a light shining on it. What in the world are Christians doing with idols in their homes? Those are things that are used in pagan worship. A number of years ago, I knew of a traveling evangelist who had done some work on various Indian reservations out in the West, and while he was there, he had picked up some souvenirs from a witch doctor. And he carried those with him to show. But he was always sick, always sick. And finally, someone pointed out to him that those things had been used in pagan worship of demons, and he ought to get rid of them. This was back in the 1950s when I met this individual. He burned those things, and his sicknesses disappeared instantly. People, the spirit world is real. We've been talking about that on Sunday morning. We've been talking about the spiritual warfare in which we're involved. Satan and all of his demonic host desire worship. But worship belongs only to God. And Jezebel had quoted the first verse here. What say I then that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifices to idols is anything? She, oh, she liked that verse. Hey, there's nothing about those things. No big deal. But then she skipped verse 20. But I say that the things which a Gentile sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be taker, partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. That's like a guy stepping out on his wife. He spends time with one, and then he goes over and spends time with another one. And then he goes back and spends time with one, and he goes over and spends time with the other one. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Isn't that kind of stupid to do something like that? Suppose a woman was doing that, and her husband has the strength of Samson. And when he, she comes through the door and he knows it, he grabs her by the neck, lifts her off the floor, shakes her a little bit, and says, what do you think you are doing? Do you provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Paul says, all things are lawful for me. Yeah, I can eat that meat, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but all things edify not. They do not build up the body. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. You're not looking out just for yourself. You're looking out for the rest of the body of Christ. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat. Asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now see, Jezebel liked that verse. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, say your next door neighbor says, hey, we're having a barbecue tonight. You want to come on over? You think, man, I've been trying to witness them for a long time. And it's always easier to witness 
you know, when you're sitting around eating with somebody and you're making polite, easy talk. So he says, if any man say to you, uh, bid you to a feast, and you feel like you want to go, you'd be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. You don't need to say, which supermarket did you buy this at? Did you buy this at a kosher supermarket? Or did you buy it down there at the Temple of Athena? Paul says you don't have to ask that question because the food itself is not the problem. But listen to this. But if any man say unto you, oh, by the way, Joe, I know you're a Christian. <laughs> and doesn't that steak look good? Oh, man, it looks good. I can smell it sizzling on the grill right now. It's two inches thick. It's the porterhouse steak. <laughs> Primer, it's what I love. Oh man, I love that kind of steak. Isn't that good? And the guy puts it on your plate and he opens it up. It's medium rare and it just, it's just the way you like it. You see the juice dripping off it. You smell it. You take the fork and you're about to put it in your mouth and the guy says, oh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know that particular piece of meat was offered to Diana. You think, well, there's nothing wrong with the meat. I, I, I heard Paul say something about that. and I, I don't know exactly what to do. I don't want to offend the neighbor. I want to be able to be witness to him. I, I want him to see that, that I'm okay with it and that, you know, I, I'll accept him if he accepts me. And so we'll do this dialogue and then, 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 then I can witness to him. And you stuff it in your mouth. Paul says, don't you do it. Because he's testing you. He's heard what Christians believe. He's heard that they want to take separated stands. He's heard that their lives have changed since they've left their pagan backgrounds. He's heard that they used to be involved in all kinds of immorality and stuff like that, but when they, when they got saved, they don't do that anymore. And he heard that they used to go down to the temple there and, and eat that meat there at the temple and participate with the prostitutes at the temple. He just wants to see how far he can push you. Because the next time he's going to say, hey, you want to go with me to the meat market? Let's go ahead and pick up some stuff. And you sort of hesitate, but you think, well, I'm trying to be friends to him. I'm, I'm trying to have this friendship evangelism approach where, you know, we go and do stuff together. We go fishing together and, and we go play baseball together and, and we go down to the market together and we pick up the meat at the temple and next time down at the market he says, hey, come over here. Isn't she pretty cute? You look and say, man, she's pretty cute. He says, come on, let's go talk to her. And he sucks you right back in. If a man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not, now listen to the reason, for his sake that showed it, that's reason number one. You want to reach him for Christ? then you show him you have nothing to do with the idols anymore, even if it's the best piece of steak you ever saw in your life. And reason number two, and for conscience sake. When you violate your conscience, it's always there. You are a believer and you know you sin. Yes, you can be forgiven, but you know you violated the holiness of your Lord because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy which temple ye are. Paul's warning the Corinthians of precisely the same principle. Because that will be on your conscience. You will have defiled the temple of God. You will have damaged yourself and you will have damaged someone else even if it's forgiven. If in a drunken rage you run over a child and kill that child, you will get sober again and you can be forgiven, but it will not bring back that child from the dead. 
Sin is a serious thing. And then he quotes, in fact, he does this twice in this passage, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, you don't need that meat. You don't need that thing that you want to put in your pocket. You don't need that sex. You don't need whatever it is because God owns everything and he will provide for you what he knows you need. He'll provide it at the right time and you don't have to violate his word to do it and you don't have to be a bad testimony to do it and you can lead people to Christ without being a bad testimony and compromising with their wickedness. In fact, you'll be a much better testimony, says the Apostle Paul, if you don't do it. And then he says in verse 29, Conscience, I say, not of thine own, but of the other. Because you see, you'll defile the other man's conscience too. Huh. But, but why should I worry about his conscience? He's a pagan. Because you see, you just put a stumbling block in his way. But it's my liberty. Look what he says at the end of verse 29. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Do you remember our discussion of Christian liberty? Liberty is not the right to do what you want to do. Liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. You should memorize that. I wrote that more than 50 years ago after studying this issue, and I'm convinced that, that still sticks today. Liberty is not the right to do what you want to do. Liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. The Holy Spirit will give you that power because he lives inside of you and he doesn't want his temple defiled at all. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? In other words, I can eat this with grace. And then the guy criticizes me. Remember, you're trying to witness to this guy. For why am I evil spoken of? For that which I give thanks. Hey, look. That plate was set in front of me. That was the juiciest, nicest looking steak. It smelled so good. I got a little splattery of it. hit my tongue. Oh, what a steak that was. And I said, praise God. Thank you for this steak. It's the best steak I've ever had in my life. And the guy says, by the way, I just wanted to mention to you, that was offered to an idol. What you do is you restrict your liberty. Not merely for your own conscience sake, but for the conscience of the man who just told you that. There was a reason that he told you that. He wanted to see what you as a Christian would do in that circumstance. Verse 31. Did you know that every time you sit down, you've got to glorify God? Every time you sit down at breakfast, lunch, or dinner, Look at verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That determines not only what you eat, and Paul says, you know, this thing about eating meat off of diets is no big deal, but it has implications. You have to be able to eat it to the glory of God. It determines what you eat. It also determines how much you eat, since your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And gluttony is clearly, in Scripture, a sin. If you eat too much, if you gluttonize, you aren't doing it to the glory of God. And you not only give thanks for your food, but you are saying, God, I want to glorify you with the way in which this body takes in this food, digests this food, the energy that this food produces, so that I might more faithfully and consistently and perfectly and energetically serve Jesus Christ. But he says, what you eat and what you drink. That determines the kind of beverages you can't consume. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby 
is not wise. You see, when you get down to the principle level, not just talk about all the extraneous, well, if I can't smoke Marlboros, can I smoke one of those uh, water pipes that the Arabs smoke because it takes all the nicotine and all the tobacco out uh, because it pulls it through water and the water absorbs that stuff and then, then I can get the pure smoke in. You're missing the point. Whatsoever you do, don't just do it in neutral. Do all to the glory of God. Are you doing that to glorify God? You say, no, then why are you doing it? That applies not only to what you eat and you drink, but then he generalizes it. Do all to the glory of God. Do you consciously think about that when you get up in the morning? I certainly do. It's one of my favorite verses. Lord, help me to glorify you this day in everything that I do in the way that I use my time, in the amount of time I spend on each different item that I have to spend time on, in the places that they go, in the places where I will talk to people, the things that I say to them, like that interaction that I had yesterday, the guy, the older gentleman outside the pharmacy. And we talked for about 30 minutes. Do you pray for opportunities to glorify God? You say, yeah, but that, that might mean I have to suffer to glorify God because, you know, we suffer, we glorify God. Whether by life or by death, do all to the glory of God. Do you consciously think of that in everything that you do? That should be on the forefront of your mind every waking moment of the day. In what way can I most perfectly bring glory to God through the activities of this day? I hope you think of that tomorrow morning when you get up. It's a new day, Lord. Show me how I can glorify you this day. But you say, I'm not an evangelist. I can't stand up on a platform. I can't shout and scream like the pastor does. Well, I hope that's not the way you think of me, but maybe you do. But even in little things, the way you do your job, you can do it for the glory of God. Sardis lost that point. They didn't do anything for the glory of God because... They didn't do anything. They had a name they were proud of, but they were dead. Dead people don't do anything. And they certainly don't do anything to the glory of God. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then here's another principle here. Verse 32, give none offense. Neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Those are the three divisions of people in the world. Did you know that? There are only three divisions of people in the world. Jews, Gentiles, and church of God. You're going to fall into one of those three categories. Either you're a Jew, you're a Gentile, or you're part of the body of Christ, which is composed of both Jews and Gentiles, but it is a distinct living organism. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many. Now here's his ultimate goal, that they may be saved. If you want to be a witness, if you want to lead people to Christ, if you want to be unashamed about sharing Christ with others, Paul says these are the principles you follow. You restrict yourself so that someone else might see Jesus living in you instead of seeing you living your own life, doing your own thing, and then trying to talk to them and tell them that they need to come to Christ. Well, our time is up. But we've at least tied a few of the principles together, uh, and the Lord willing, we'll hopefully finish that. From all these previous churches to the church at Sardis, the church that had a name that they live, and yet they were dead. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that you might fill our hearts with joy and gladness as we not only learn the technical issues of the text and the interesting comparisons between the churches and the things that were good and the things that were bad and then we jolly go on our way and forget them. Help us to remember, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The churches. Hear what the Spirit says to Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, New Jersey. Hear what the Spirit saith. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God speaking to Collingswood to the people who are here tonight, to the people who are listening on the internet, to all those who rest on our laurels as we think about the grand past of this church. We have a name that we live, and yet we are, you fill in the blank. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this time tonight Help us to apply it in Jesus' name. Amen.